From CBS News Bay Area, this is the Morning Edition. Oakland business owners are trying a new tactic to try and keep thieves away, but could it turn some customers away in the process? A, a smart decision, but it's also unfortunate because uh, we want this, this restaurant to be available for everyone. The city, the state, and the feds are teaming up to crack down on drugs in San Francisco, but a new report shows the crisis is still growing. And we head up to Twin Peaks to hear from people who are working to install the Pink Triangle. Good morning. It is Sunday, June 18th. Happy Father's Day. Hey, Dad. I'm Devin Feely. Let's start with a quick check of our weather with First Alert meteorologist Darren Pack. We're starting out this Sunday morning with a few clouds, a little bit of the marine layer, some higher clouds, but it's all going to melt back pretty quickly. And we'll have more sunshine today than we had yesterday. But we're also going to be cooler. A couple of things about today. Father's Day is going to be about 5 to 7 degrees cooler than we were on Saturday. And it's going to be a bit breezy. See, the daytime highs for our warmest inland valleys are only going to the low to mid-70s. We were in the 80s there yesterday. And just to show you how the wind's going to pick up today, watch the screen light up. About a 25-mile-an-hour gust by the afternoon. No wind advisories, but noticeably breezy. I'll have the rest of the first alert forecast coming up. Some business owners in Oakland say that they're completely fed up with break-ins, and they're frustrated that it doesn't seem that they or the police can do anything from stopping these crimes from happening. So several of them have decided to fight back by going cashless. But as Betty Yu explains, this may come at the cost of losing some potential customers. After suffering their third break in in less than a year, Asha Tea House in Uptown Oakland decided to go cashless. There's a sign on the storefront. And across the street on Grand Avenue, Cafe Umami also put up a similar sign stating no cash on premises. It was targeted multiple times by thieves. Yeah. What would you like? Oh, I'm um, a soft serve, sprinkles, and then a repair plug. Arthur Max Tap and Snack on MLK Junior Way has also dealt with burglaries. We went cashless only because of this, uh, to, to protect our employees. Fontel Flowers is the beverage manager. He said the owner didn't want to exclude customers who don't have smartphones or credit cards, but says it had no choice but to go cashless after an armed robbery last year. Merchants also have to pay fees for credit card transactions. I think. It is a good decision and very safe, a, a smart decision. But it's also unfortunate because uh, we want this, this restaurant to be available for everyone. Fontel said there have been no robberies since the decision. The owner has also spent $20,000 on security cameras and invested in several types of alarms and wants the city to do more to clean up the neighborhood. When the sun goes down, this neighborhood is really dark. And perfect, perfect, a perfect uh, space for, for criminal activity. So, car break ins? All the time. My car is parked across the street. It, gets, it got broken into right across the street. Her car got broken into twice since I've worked here. Fontel has been working here for about a year. A few miles away in Chinatown, the Oakland Chinatown Chamber of Commerce said it's been working since the pandemic to help many mom and pop shops go cashless. To date, there are few cash only establishments, according to board member Carl Chan. I think it would be more convenient because nowadays people don't really carry, carry much cash. We are also, also asking uh, business owners, uh, especially in Chinatown, do not you know, carry any cash after they close a the business. And making sure that they are able to go to the banks uh, if they do have cash. We turn now to the drug crisis in San Francisco. The city's medical examiner released a new report this week on accidental overdose deaths, and the numbers are pretty alarming. According to that report, 74 people OD'd and died in May. That is more than two a day, and it was the worst month since the city started keeping track in 2020. 63 of those deaths were linked to fentanyl. 346 people have overdosed and died in the city since January. That's nearly 40% more than the same period last year. And it's well on pace to pass the numbers from each of the previous three years. But more help is on the way from the federal government. Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi says more money and more manpower will be sent to the city to fight drug trafficking, especially fentanyl. This is all part of what's being called Operation Overdrive. Now, the Congresswoman said in the statement, quote, Operation Overdrive will help our city address this tragedy by targeting the criminals who are doing the most harm, removing deadly fentanyl from our streets and reduced rates of violence. 
Now, that's on top of the increased efforts by local police, the CHP, and the National Guard. But some of the people who deal with the crisis every day told our John Ramos that this kind of crackdown may not actually be the best way to solve the problem. San Francisco's drug addiction crisis has reached a new level. The numbers on overdoses are shocking even those who deal with addiction for a living. The question now, of course, is what to do about it. You don't have to travel very far in the city before you see someone in the grips of the fentanyl bend. Robert O'Rourke knows it well. And that's why you see people bent over all the time. That fentanyl has got them so, uh, you know, it's so strong that it just it kills them. It's killing them. Robert is a recovering drug addict who was saved by a program of the St. Anthony's Foundation in the Tenderloin. His experience lends credibility when people like this man come in for help. He doesn't judge people, but admits that San Francisco's permissive attitude is drawing people with addiction problems to the city. There's a fine line between helping somebody and enabling them to keep doing it. And that is facts. You know? And where is San Francisco on that line? Man. They're right there on the line, you know. That feeling has led politicians like Governor Gavin Newsom and Mayor London Breed to pursue a law enforcement crackdown on drug sales and open air use. But Gary McCoy, with an organization called Health Right 360, thinks that's creating a false choice. There's this notion that's entirely incorrect that says we either have to do this or that. And the problem is, we're not looking at the things that we know work in between. He says the ill-fated Tenderloin Center on Market Street prevented hundreds of fatal overdoses in the 11 months of its operation. But the city abruptly shut it down when the safe use facility came under fire legally and politically. We know that every opi opioid related overdose death is preventable and we have the tools and we have the knowledge and we know it works and we lack the political will to scale that up. Back at St. Anthony's, they take a compassionate approach, not forcing treatment, but offering guys like Robert as a beacon of hope. Honestly, different things work for different people, but here at St. Anthony's, what we found is um, making recovery services accessible is what works. We try to lead by example. It's tough to just push somebody into recovery. It has to be a choice. I think there's a lot of hope left, you know? As long as there's uh, places like St. Anthony's to go do, there's always hope. Hope is always alive. Okay. Sometimes that's all we got. Hope may be all San Francisco's got right now, although the numbers aren't inspiring a lot of that either. A new study by the American Journal of Public Health suggests that seizing opioids may be linked to increased overdose deaths. Now, the study examined two years of data from Indianapolis. It showed that overdose deaths doubled the week after the seizures. Now, that may be because the opioid users who are cut off from their regular supply are at higher risk of overdose when they find a new supplier whose drugs have an unknown potency. Never before. Hope, love, pride. Proudly presented by Pet Food Express and Broadway San Jose. Volunteers gathered at San Francisco's AIDS Memorial for a monthly community workday. Now, this month's event had a special guest. Former Speaker Nancy Pelosi joined, two, the, joined the 200 volunteers. Organizers say they're celebrating the Congresswoman's principles of love and action and leadership. They say to me, it's easy for you. San Francisco is so tolerant. I said, and you've heard me say this before, Please don't use the word tolerant when you talk about San Francisco. For us, that's a condescending word. We're not talking about tolerance. We're talking about respect. We're talking about taking pride. Happy Pride Month to all of you. The Congresswoman planted a commemorative tree and rolled up her sleeves to help tend the grounds of the National AIDS Memorial Grove. Another symbol of solidarity that emerged from the AIDS crisis is San Francisco's annual pink triangle on Twin Peaks. Activists have reclaimed this one-time symbol of hate, turning it into a sign of strength and community. I caught up with the founder and some of the volunteers as they put up the giant triangle. We wear our pink triangles out of camaraderie for those who were forced to wear them in the Holocaust. Pink Triangle founder Patrick Carney rallied a small army of volunteers at Twin Peaks, helping to install the iconic symbol. 
And among their ranks were first timers like Josh Gray. This is my first time helping set up the pink triangle. And being a morning person, I just jumped in and grabbed the waivers for folks to fill out. The Pink Triangle traces its historic roots of the persecution of gays and lesbians during World War II in Nazi Germany. Back then, it was a symbol of persecution and pain. Its meaning now, however, is much different, symbolizing pride and the freedom to be who you are, to love who you love openly and unapologetically. I just wanted to be a part of that. Uh, it's, it means a lot to me, and I think it's, especially in, in the current political times, Rosie Hanna is a first-time volunteer as well. She says the LGBTQ community should savor the hard-fought freedoms it now enjoys while realizing those gains are not guaranteed. I've moved to San Francisco in 94, and uh, first time to actually install the Pink Triangle. This was the first time since the pandemic that the Pink Triangle was once again an in-person, hands-on art installation. Each volunteer, a piece of the fabric, of this special community. Even though I've been in the Bay Area for like over 10 years, I've never volunteered. So, wanting to be more active. We're posting all of our pride stories in a special section on our website at kpix.com and we'll be streaming even more all month long on CBS News, Bay Area.